Welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. This is a space we've created to explore the components of diversity, inclusion, and cultural competency. Cultural competency. And all of the ways in which these components present themselves in our professional and personal lives. Be it language, culture, socioeconomic class, gender, race, ability level, age, or so many other identifiers. Everything begins with a conversation. conversation. Join us in this space where we seek to empower, educate, and uplift by creating authentic conversations on issues that affect us every day in every way. We look forward to you joining us in our discussions with everyone from thought leaders, diversity and inclusion strategists, students to CEOs in the corporate, education, and nonprofit sectors. Let's discuss how we can better understand differences and leverage commonality. Let's do away with political correctness, explore ideation, build community, and create allies. Let's start an authentic conversation. This is the Global Fluency Podcast, and this is Bertine Crevacore West. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. I'm your host, Bertine Prevacore West, and I'm delighted to be here with you today. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Wendy May. So I'm going to tell you a bit about Wendy. Wendy is a purpose coach, conscious leadership consultant, author, and speaker on regenerative purpose. After leaving behind a successful career in corporate leadership and management consulting, she embarked on a heart-led journey of service work in 2015. As a frame breaker and change maker, she supports individuals and groups who are expanding toward their full potential to contribute to a better world. Wendy, welcome to the Global Fluency Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. I'm super excited to have you here, and I'm really delighted um, to have met you, and that also I want to tell our listeners that, you know, we are having, what, an 11 or is it a 13-hour time difference? So Mm -hmm. I'm super glad that uh, we could be here together in this space um, that we created uh, where we're going to talk about every aspect of diversity, and and the Global Fluency Podcast, that's what it does, and so um, I loved when I first read your bio because... I thought this would be perfect for the show because you bring this um, refreshing view to purpose. And so as part of the show um, explores diversity of thought, I was delighted that um, you agreed to be a guest on the show. So thank you for being here with me right now. Mm, Thanks. And so Wendy, can you tell us a bit more about your professional background and and how that led to your current career? Yeah. So I... um... As you know, you just read in my bio, I spent a long time in sort of typical corporate America types of jobs. I was in leadership and development. Um, I did consulting work for a while, mostly with big Fortune 500 companies doing organizational redesign and executive coaching, working with senior leaders, mostly that were going through massive changes. And I went through a massive change myself in 2015 when I decided to leave that world and go out on my own as an independent executive coach. And since then, I've kind of branched out into a lot of different things. Um, I run group retreats. I do a lot of teaching around something called the Enneagram. I have written a book, which I'm sure we'll touch on a bit in this interview, Regenerative Purpose. Um, And I also do coaching around that as well. So that's my main focus nowadays is really helping people to step into greater alignment with their purpose. And it's sort of, uh, it's a common thread among many of the things that I do. I also have a, I almost forgot, I also have an online business selling biodegradable glitter. So I'm a bit of a activist in many different dimensions. So just around ecological awareness as well. So that's also something that I do. That's fantastic. Biodegradable glitter. I feel like, again, every time I speak to you, I feel like we could have multiple episodes, <laughs> multiple interviews within a podcast episode. Uh, but yeah. can I ask you, what led you to do that? Like, that's so something that, I don't know, I've, I, I have not heard of that until you just said it. So what led you to do that? Well, this is actually an incredible example of exactly what I'm talking about with regenerative purpose, right? So I did not ever have glitter as part of my life growing up. Like, I was not one of these festival kids that, you know, went to all these raves and things like that. So I was really guided to start this business because I had a really strong emotional experience with using glitter while being in nature and having kind of this sudden realization, which I actually tell this story in the book around how this is microplastic pollution that's going into the ocean and that it's directly going into our water system. 
And so I had this kind of moment of insight that was for me very emotional. Like I was crying and really like really touched when I sort of had this insight. And it, because it was such a strong emotional realization for me that I was motivated then to spend many months researching the topic and thinking, why don't we have a better alternative, right? And different people were just around the same time starting to come up with different options. And then I was sort of, you know, in between things at that time, I was in between projects and um, consulting gigs. So I, I didn't have a lot to do, to be honest. So there was this white space for me to actually learn something new for myself, how to build an online business selling products and all of the logistics and the warehousing and operations and website development of all of that was exciting for me to learn. And um, to use this business actually as a vehicle for something that I care a lot about, which is bringing people's awareness to ecological consciousness, right? So the idea that everything that you buy and use and consume and throw away is connected to everything else. And it's amazing. Glitter is a beautiful visual for this because you can imagine how you take it out of the container, you put it on your body, and then you shower or you go swim in the ocean. It rinses off. And then that is going into the ecosystem, being eaten by little fish, which are eaten by bigger fish, which then it comes back, right? It comes back to the human uh, part of the life cycle chain, right? So It's a very beautiful visual to see how on a very um, global level, we are all connected, right? So it's a spiritual concept we talk about all the time that, okay, yeah, we're all one, we're all connected, but glitter really illustrates that in a way, right? And you can see how through these small actions, everything that you do touches everyone else, right? I mean, we're seeing that happening right now with the coronavirus, right? This is another example that nature is showing us how everything that everyone does touches everyone else. So yeah, it's really connected actually to this idea of regenerative purpose. What a beautiful journey and honestly um, a beautiful path to activism that one might not otherwise think of because when you think of glitter, you don't, at least I think, you know, lay people like myself don't automatically think, oh, okay, now I'm going to help save the planet. You know what I mean? Because, mm-hmm. But what a wonderful journey to lead us to see that. I think that's, now I'm never going to look at glitter the same again, quite honestly. Um, <laughs> I think that's fantastic. It, it's really, it's showing us the interconnectedness of the world and something that we otherwise might have taken for granted. So I commend you on starting a company, you know, based on an experience, you know, that's wonderful. That's amazing. So that will lead us then to, you know, talking about regenerative purpose. So tell us a bit about your book and what regenerative purpose is. Yeah. It seems so timely right now, which is crazy to me to think that I started writing this book in 2018. And now looking at what's going on in the world, I'm like, wow, this is so perfect, right? In terms of what we're going through right now. Um, as a human species. And the reason that I started writing the book is because I was doing a lot of work with women as a coach and in leading retreats around transition, right? So I was kind of helping people that were making changes in their career, either stepping out of corporate into entrepreneurship or, you know, changing into a different um, function or different profession. And I didn't call it purpose at the time, but what I realized looking backwards was that everybody who was kind of navigating this shift, they were ultimately motivated by having more meaning, right? And that this was a common theme that we really are hungry for meaning. And often when we feel like something that we're doing doesn't fit us anymore, it's because there's not meaning in it anymore or that we've lost the plot on the purpose of what we're doing. And so I started to understand looking backwards that actually what I was helping people do was align with their purpose. And In the process of doing this work, I realized that a lot of the traditional self-help models around purpose are very linear, logical, strategic, and goal-oriented, right? So in a sense, I feel like we're in this massive change time, right, where we're sort of talking about the end of the patriarchy, everyone is all abuzz about this new normal that we're trying to create, Mm -hmm. and yet a lot of the way that we're doing things is still the old way, right? It's still in this very driven, ego-focused, individualistic, um, achievement-oriented way. And a lot of the, I guess, existing conventional wisdom around purpose is that as well, right? It talks about finding your purpose, 
figuring out your purpose, kind of almost as if purpose is this um, secret mission that we have encoded in our DNA that we have to diagnose or discover, and that it's like this secret um, that we have to find out, right? And that there's a singular you know, life purpose for every soul on the planet and that there's just this one thing and you have to, yeah, sort of capture it somehow. But my understanding of how it works from my own experience and also a lot of the clients that I've worked with is that it's much more dynamic. It's much more co-creative and it's much more interdependent. So regenerative purpose is basically how do we embody our purpose in a way that's in alignment with the rhythms and cycles of nature? right? Recognizing that as human beings, we are part of nature, right? And so part of the problem, right, that we're facing right now is that we've become very separate from nature. So how do we actually choose and go about our work in a way that recognizes this kind of bigger truth that humanity is part of nature and that it's not all about me, 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 Mm -hmm. but that we shift our orientation to we, Wow. I, there were so many nuggets and gems that I picked up from what you were saying there. Like you dropped a lot of them in, in your statement for us. So what I'm hearing is, and, and I feel like I've, I'm hearing people trying to express this, but they don't have the language for it, right? Um, especially when we're dealing with um, COVID-19 as we are right now, I think it's a time of global trauma. And as with any traumatic experience, people are trying to find their way. And this time that we are, you know, quarantining or self-quarantining at home, it presents itself as an opportunity for growth. But I think when we don't have the language, because we may not even understand, you know, and that's why I asked you what regenerative purpose was, because we may not even understand um, what it is we're trying to do, because we, we are trying to find that now, I think as a society, I think globally, because um, part of what I was going to ask you was about um, how does regenerative purpose differ from the dominant paradigm of destiny-driven purpose? And, and you answer that. Um, and so I think right now, that's where we're finding ourselves. We're finding ourselves kind of going against the mission, you know, destiny-driven purpose, right? Because that right. was me, 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 me you know, and now when it comes to something that's affecting the we, like, I think a lot of us are just like, okay, how do I, how do I evolve right now? Right. But I, I, and that's why I think your book and and the, the theory behind it is so needed and so timely, you know, Mm -hmm. because who could have predicted this a year ago, but I think it's, it's a time for us to be able to have to look inward to see not only how do we reframe our, our own purpose, but how do we help our neighbor on a global scale? Because I think this is us coming out of this is going to, we have to come out of it differently and better. Like we can't go back to operating according to the, the traditional paradigms that we were operating from before. And so another thing that I want to ask you with regard to regenerative purpose is what role does culture play? Because when we are growing up, particularly as you and I were discussing offline, um, I'm the child of immigrants, you're the child of immigrants. And so when we do grow up, we are, we are programmed with, with things that we have to do, right? And what we, yeah. you know, what we would refer to as culture, because culture is basically um, knowledge passed on and tradition from the previous generation, right? And it's a, an accumulation you know, of all that knowledge. So with regard to regenerative purpose, what role does culture play? And how does it, how difficult is it for us to find our purpose in a different way now? Now we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Westbridge Solutions is a professional training company focusing on diversity, inclusion, cultural competence, and soft skills trainings. Westbridge Solutions offers a variety of innovative training courses, both in person and online live and self-paced. Their clients include corporations, government organizations, healthcare organizations, the nonprofit sector, universities, and individuals such as yourself. Through their rigorous training programs, trainees learn to understand differences, leverage commonalities, and achieve organizational, professional, and personal actualization. To learn more about Westbridge Solutions, please feel free to visit their website at www dot westgrouptraining.com 
or follow them on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Westbridge Solutions, empowering professionals for success. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is, for me, this is the main thing right now. And it's extremely challenging, right? Because all of us have been trained in a different way. We've been educated in this system that teaches us this very linear, logical, strategic, goal-directed way of being. And so there's a lot of unlearning and reprogramming that we have to do in order to embody regenerative purpose, right? So to not just do the what differently, but do the how we're doing things differently. Um, it's, it's really deep inner work, actually, right? So on some level, when I talk to people about regenerative purpose, there's a sense of relaxation of like, oh, great, you're telling me I don't need to find my singular life mission. I can just kind of calm down about that, right? Like I'm not missing something if I don't have a, a boilerplate sort of purpose statement to offer you. But the flip side of that is that what it actually requires in order to step into regenerative purpose is not an easy solution, right? It's not something that I can give you on a silver platter, right? Like there's no five-step formula for regenerative purpose. It's actually the process of cultivating qualities within ourselves and practices that we have to kind of um, have a devotion to on a regular basis in order to stay aligned. And of course, because, you know, as I talk about in the book, there are cycles, right? There are cycles, there are cycles of nature and there are cycles of purpose, right? So there are ways that we, there are ways that we kind of create forms from our purpose. And then there are also ways that we have to kind of let those forms go. So the same way that we are really focused, I think, in the default world on growth, right? So in the business world, there's so much that we focus around growth but there's not so much focus around the natural process of decay or death or letting things go, right? And this is the regenerative part of it, is that we need to get better at letting things go, of understanding when something has sort of lived its life and it needs to transition to something else, or something that we're working on might need to transform into a different domain, or that we need to make a pivot personally and put our energy into something completely different than what we've been doing. And this is not the way that we've been taught, right? The way that we've been trained and educated, it's all about, you know, you go through your life in a linear way where you build upon your experience, you develop your expertise, you climb the ladder, right? This is a very linear process. And the way that I imagine it moving in the future is that it's much less linear, right? That our resume will look less like a chronology and more like a mind map, right? It's more a cloud, you know, versus like a linear timeline. I, I love that you said that we need to think about in the, with the process of growth comes thoughts of decay and death. And I think a part of the reason why we are programmed not to think about that is because of fear, right? And based on what you're saying, regenerative purpose, as I'm understanding it, requires us to do the work right? It's a proactive measure as opposed to a reactive measure or a program measure, right? And I yeah. think part of the reason why that might be difficult for people to achieve is because as, as we said, um, you're, you're programmed from the time you're a certain age to do certain things, right? So to deviate from that is, is a source of stress, but it's also, you know, a source of fear because we're venturing into something unknown about ourselves, right? And about the world. Mm -hmm. So then let me ask you this. Does this mean unlearning the information? Well, it does mean that we have to unlearn the information with which we've been culturally programmed, but how do we do that? Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways. And this is, um, this is really the, the meat of the work that I do, right, with individuals and with groups is it's super customized, I guess, into your particular circumstances, right? So you have to kind of look at the whole human being. And we do have kind of shared cultural programming, but there's also a lot of individual programming, right, based on early childhood experiences or just beliefs that we've inherited from our family, from our schooling, from our communities. So all of that stuff needs to be examined. And I talk about, you know, what is it that we're trying to cultivate? And I talked about this idea that there's certain qualities in ourselves that allow purpose to flow through us as an energy, right? It's sort of the, the force of life or the force of nature that wants to move through us as human beings to express it. 
but the way that we can help that flow is by there's four qualities that I talk about, which are authenticity, attunement, responsiveness, and receptivity. And there are many, many layers for each of those four qualities. There's many layers that you can go into depth and unpack. Mm -hmm. But the way that I see it or the way that I have experienced it in my own life is that when we develop these qualities within ourselves, right, we become more authentically who we truly are, right? There's less hiding, there's less performing, there's less disowning of parts of ourselves, right? Even things that we might look at as not culturally, you know, dominant or culturally preferred, that we still bring all of ourselves to the table, right? Everything that we are, the entirety of our essence and our being and what makes us who we are, instead of shaming or hiding certain parts that we think aren't socially acceptable, right? So there's that full authenticity that really helps purpose to thrive. And attunement, um, attunement is really about listening, right? So if we think about purpose as a conversation, between us and the rest of the world, it means that we need to be as good at listening as we are at expressing, right? And I would say now we're biased in the other direction where when we're in the me, me, me mode, it's much more about expressing and sort of pushing out, you know, what we think is right into the world. But to come into balance, we need to be just as good at listening. And part of the challenge with listening right now is that there's so much noise, right? So there's a lot of fear-based media. There's a lot of sort of, I guess, fake news or, you know, memes and just distractions, right? There's just, we have so much information, but not a lot of it is actually intelligence, right? In terms of things that are actionable for us. So how do we learn how to filter out the noise so that we actually get the signals that are helping us to make better decisions and helping us to take aligned actions and not letting our energy be drained by all the noise that's not relevant to us, right? So, and I could go on about responsiveness and receptivity, but you kind of get the idea, right? So there's these qualities that we want to develop in ourselves that actually help purpose to kind of show up in our life more so that we have that experience of being on purpose more, right? And it's less about finding a singular purpose that you can kind of attach a nameplate to, but more of this, I think what we're all looking for when we say we want to have purpose is actually the experience of feeling like our life matters and that we're in alignment with what we're supposed to be here doing. And that experience of being on purpose comes alive when we're really tapped into these qualities and that we're practicing things that help us connect with these qualities. Wow. That, that to me, you said so much that resonated with me, Wendy, but one thing that you said like I love the being on purpose. You know, you're you're making purpose into a verb, right? Yeah. And that's an apt word. And and I think that there is a lot uh, of um, on social media in particular, and even with you know our news channels. I um, mean, all of the information, you know, both true and false out there. As you said, fake news out there. There's a lot vying for our attention on a daily mm-hmm. basis. And what I tend to see is I, I use social media for work, but for also, you know, keeping in touch with family. But apart from that, I try not to be on it simply mm-hmm. because I feel like it takes a lot of my attention away um, from me trying to seek and learn. Right. And so like you said, um, there are memes and this and that, and, and I'm not knocking those at all um, because some of them can be humorous, but I, I do think that it's, it becomes what we call a time suck, right? And when mm-hmm. we're doing that, we're not actually able to focus on ourselves and, and mm-hmm. our learning and our growth and our development, right? So I think the more we do that, the less we're able to, as you said, be, well, the less that we're able to be intentional about being on purpose, right? Yeah. Uh, because everything that we do to, to honestly get in touch with our, our genuine authentic selves, I think has to be work. And when we're, you know, when we're just delving into social media's endless pit like that, because it Mm -hmm. does become, you know, a few minutes here becomes an hour and then becomes, you know, a couple of hours. And before you know it, I think particularly again with everybody um, or with a, a lot of people working from home or having, you know, to just stay at home, this is one of those, what we might see as an opportunity for growth 
somebody else might see um, as an opportunity to kind of relax for a while, right? And I got that in the beginning, but then I thought, what are we going to do with this time? You know, what are we going to, how are we going to come out better for it? And now is a time for us to turn inward, right? And, and do that work. But I often think that with all of the distractions out there, we're never getting a chance to really learn. And we have to take that bold step and say, okay, now I'm going to really be intentional about who I am, you know, and go against that programming that was put into me for so long. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping, you know, through this episode and through this interview with you that that does, this does serve as a catalyst to get people to think about their higher selves and, and who they genuinely are and who they want to be, right? Yeah. I think we can, we decide who we're going to be. We're born with our traits, of course, but I think deciding that I want to be a certain type of person requires me doing the work. And it requires yeah. much examination. So I'm hoping through this episode that people hear this, they read your book, and they apply um, the principles that you set forth therein. So let's see. The next question I have for you is, how does this help us respond to life's current challenges from varying cultural standpoints? Because you've lived in many different parts of the world and have come across many different people. So how does regenerative purpose help? yourself and others that you've met um, based on your experiences with them, how, how does this help them um, deal with life's current challenges? Yeah, it's, um, well, just to pick up on what you were talking about just now, I think that one of the biggest challenges right now is this attunement piece, right? This, the second quality that I mentioned, which it's absolutely true that we need to have rest and relaxation. And in a way, there is a lot happening now that's supportive of us to go into a deep rest and relaxation phase where we're in this cocoon and we can really just really regenerate, right? Go into this compost bin, basically, and like sort of shed whoever we were before COVID-19 and like just be in the nothing of, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I do. I don't know what's happening in the world. And just embracing that I don't know, this moment of beautiful uncertainty that we're in right now that's ripe with possibility. So we're really fertilizing the ground for the new thing to grow. And part of that is allowing this deep rest and relaxation. And the thing about media use is that it's all about the intention that we use it with, right? So social media and technology in general can be an amazingly powerful tool to um, express our purpose, to connect with people, to build community. I mean, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now if it wasn't for social media and technology, Absolutely. right? So it's, a, it's an amazing blessing. Mm -hmm. And we need to be mindful of it so that we are using media. Media is not using us. Sure. So I think that this idea of being on purpose, like we can't really be on purpose if we are caught up in mass distraction. So for me, I always think about the balance of information and action, right? So there is a need for us to sort of just watch Netflix and watch movies and listen to music and laugh at funny memes, right? Mm -hmm. So this is consuming, right? Consuming media. Mm -hmm. And then there's creating, right? So creating whatever our own expression is, what we want to share to put our voice out into the world, to be creative around art and photography and writing or whatever it is, right? So there is the contribution to that where when we're creative, we kind of feel more aligned and alive, right? So if we're out of balance with we have way more information than action, or another way to think about it is way more consumption than creation, that actually leads to disempowering us. In many cases, leads to depression, right? So a lot of people, I think, are feeling this sense of restlessness or helplessness right now because we're really out of balance in terms of the amount of information that we're taking in and the amount of action that we feel we can take. So I think maybe this is one of the things that I would say is an important takeaway potentially from this conversation for me is that I would really love for people who are listening to this, if there's um, any insights or inspiration to just be mindful about the use of media, right? That's one little nugget in terms of how much information are you taking in and how much action is that inspiring? And if you're taking in way more information 
then you actually feel like you can take action about that's useful and aligned, then there might need to be some readjustment in terms of that, right? To help you feel better, take in less information, take more action. Wow, Wendy, you blew me away with that one. Because in my mind, I just started seeing it as a mathematical equation, right? You can only, you can't reach a certain threshold, right? There has to be a, a balance of the two. And, and that has to be in equal parts at the very least, I would think. And what you said resonated with me because when we first were um, asked to quarantine, is that, and as I mentioned, I'm in Atlanta. And so when we first were asked to quarantine, it was, um, I want to say now we're entering into our sixth week. And at first, the first week for me was a very big shift uh, because although my existence had been a hybrid one, um, you know, working outside, speaking, um, doing other things, and then working from my office, it was still a shift because now everybody was home, right? And I also found that, you know, I had to do um, online schooling with my little one and I had to, you know, all of a sudden everybody wants, you know, three meals a day. And, and so, you know, you're getting distracted. And then family members and colleagues who were home, some of them not working um, from home per se, but some of them were, um, everybody wants to be in touch. And I remember that first week in particular, I felt very unlike myself. And I thought it was because, okay, everybody's going through this radical shift and we don't know, you know, when and how long, well, when it's going to end and how long it will continue and, and things of that nature. But then at one point, uh, maybe five days into it, I, I realized that I need to do work, right? Because at first we were all tuned into the news and what's going on, what's going on, what's going on. And I realized that I was feeling so uneasy because I hadn't had a time to work. And for me, this is part of my work and I love my work. And, and so when you said consumption versus creation, I realized in hindsight now I have the, the words for it because you coined it so well. But in that moment, I realized that, you know, if I couldn't work, I couldn't find my happy place in order to deal with this in the way that I knew would be best for me and my family. And the amazing thing was, by the time I got to, you know, that fourth, fifth day, I just decided I'm going to create a podcast, uh, not a podcast, pardon me, I'm going to create um, a webinar series on people transitioning into the digital world and, and hopefully it will be something that helped them do that. And I kid you not, my family was wonderful. They let me be in, you know, my laboratory, my office, and, and I was able to create um, this content that was really um, six hours in length and, and that took such a while to make. But what ended up happening was that I didn't realize I was holding my breath and I had let it go at that moment because I was able to return to that place of equilibrium, that happy place, because I was able to create. Mm. That makes yeah. sense? Yeah, it's super important. I think that there's a reason why there's a lot of people asking questions around purpose right now, because we're in this crisis situation, right? And, and in many ways, survival is threatened, right? In terms of our physical health, but also financial stability, right? So these are very basic foundational things that are related to survival. So it's interesting because sometimes you might think, I guess, that survival and this idea of higher purpose would be opposites, right? Like we don't have time to think about purpose because we're in survival mode, but I find that it's actually the opposite. It's the more that we're in survival mode, that we're in crisis, that we do think about higher purpose, right? So if you know Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, right? This is the classic on purpose, and this is a perfect example of like in the darkest times, that is when it's the most important to really connect to this higher sense of why are we here and what are we doing? And that in a strange way that connecting to that sense of higher purpose helps us survive. It makes us more healthy. I mean, there are literally studies that have been done around people and their life expectancy um, being increased by having a sense of purpose. So, you know, the more that you have a reason for being, the more healthy that you'll be. And I mean, there are not studies on this, but I would assume that the more purposeful you are, that the better your immune system is probably, right? So that there's a connection actually between higher purpose 
and our survival on a very basic level. And that leads me to our next question. And I think you sort of answered this already. So what role does regenerative purpose play with regard to our resiliency? Yeah, that's exactly it. Totally. That's exactly it. So having a sense of purpose absolutely helps us to weather the storms, right? For me, like if I'm having an off day, if I'm feeling lonely, you know, I'm solo quarantining and, um, or if I'm feeling just, yeah, kind of angry or just emotional, like upset, you know, wanting to cry a lot or whatever, what always brings me back to center is to do something that is part of my purpose, whether it's sharing with my book holding space for a friend who's going through a rough time or connecting with my family, right? These are all dimensions of purpose. It it doesn't necessarily have to be limited also to work, right? Right. Purpose is also how you're showing up in the whole web of your life of all of the people that you touch and connect with. So anything that feels purposeful Mm -hmm. helps me to kind of get back to myself and get back to my center when I'm having a bad day. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's all about mindset. And recognizing when, with regard to our purpose, right, it's, I think it's important for us to, I always say it's important for people to do an internal SWOT analysis, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm taking it back to the corporate days with that, <laughs> but <laughs> I cringed a little bit. But um, I, I do think that's a, a necessary thing for us to do in order to, to kind of calibrate and recalibrate when necessary, right? To always return back to center. And so for me, that's one of the things that I find that I'm consistently doing. I don't think it's good for anyone, um, but I'm seeking for myself to be complacent, right? Because just because I'm I'm dealing with this moment right now, because we all manifest stress in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm dealing with this this traumatic experience that we're all experiencing on a global level in my particular way. Now, that might not look like stress to someone else, right? But for me, I can feel it. And so I always take a moment and take stock because anytime I'm, I'm taken away from what I feel is my purpose here in the world, and, and it, part of it was some of the things that you were saying. So my purpose professionally is one thing. My purpose personally is another thing. And a lot of times they are in alignment. You know, part of that is for me to always be present, but sometimes I realize I can't be the professional that I want to be, you know, a hundred percent when it's time for me to be the mom that I want to be or the wife that I want to be. You know, I feel like we can have everything, but not all at once. Right. And so Mm -hmm. sometimes I need to recalibrate that. And so that's why I'm always thinking, um, you know, all right, am I, anytime I'm feeling a certain way, just as you said, when you're feeling upset about something, you know, or you want to cry about something or, you know, and, and we should allow ourselves to experience those things too, right? I don't want people to think we shouldn't. We definitely should. But to me, there has to be a reason that we're going through that. And so I always examine the reason, why do I feel like crying right now? What can I do to make myself feel better, but not forget that emotion, right? Because I want to acknowledge that emotion because that emotion is important. But now how am I going to use that emotion to better serve, right? Um, To better serve the people that I love and I care for and the people that need me. So that's what I took. Exactly. You're by, like, we don't want to bypass, right? So like we want to feel the feelings Mm -hmm. because that's information also. Yes. Um, So I, Yeah, I have a whole section in the book around this about pain. Um, I love acronyms. So I made an acronym for pain being personally activating information. And I worked on another interview and I'm so glad you brought up pain because it's in my notes right now to ask you. So talk to me about pain. Say it again one more time for our listeners. Tell us what that means. Mm -hmm. Pain stands for personally activating information. So... This is a bit connected to the point before with the quality of attunement, right? So the way that I see it, pain is not just for us to suffer from, right? It's not something that um, is meant to torture us, for, for us to just, you know, be a victim of, right? So it's something that actually shows us that something is off, right? So if you think about it on a body level, it's telling your brain you need to pay attention to healing something here right? Or you're doing something maybe that's not good for you, right? It's different information for your 
brain to adjust its behavior. And on a collective level, we are in a lot of pain, right? So when we think about the experience that we're going through right now, this to me is, is the ultimate example of personally activating information, right? So when those feelings come up, right, when we feel angry or when we feel, you know, grief, it's really good to exactly the opposite of trying to push away the feeling. It's actually to dive into it more, mm-hmm. to embrace it and to investigate it and to say, hey, welcome, friend. What do you have to tell me, right? Because there is a reason why I'm crying. There's a reason why I feel so enraged that I need to punch pillows or scream in the wa- underwater, right? There is a reason for all of that. And that is to tell you something needs to shift. Something can be done, right? That's how we take an empowered stance by taking the pain, not as something that we suffer from. Of course, we can feel the ouch of it, right? It's not pleasant. We can acknowledge that it's not fun and have compassion for ourselves and for other people going through that pain. But then, you know, once we've been in it and sat in it for a while and really embraced it and made friends with it, um, it usually has something to tell us, right? It has something to tell us about some change that we need to make in our life or something that we care deeply about that we've maybe been neglecting Mm -hmm. or a way that we can contribute that we weren't aware of before, right? So those are all things that I think are coming up a lot right now. I, I love that you said with regard to pain, welcome friend, because that's not oftentimes what we'll hear when we're thinking about pain, right? And I think that's why so many people try to avoid it. They don't see that it's something that we need to go through, right? We must endure it to come out on the other side with more information, as you said. And by doing that, that allows us to emerge more fully formed, more fully evolved, because we've learned something new about ourselves, right? And I think we go through um, a painful experience rather than avoid it. Not that it makes the next painful experience less so, but I think it, it sort of builds up again that resiliency to, you know, I'm going to go through this. I'm going to be open to going through this pain to learn more about myself and learn more about why I feel a particular way. Maybe mm-hmm. experiencing that pain and asking myself, you know, why is this affecting me as it, as it does? That allows me to know something that might trigger future pain. So not that I can avoid that per se, but so I can see it coming and be in a more prepared place to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, it's part of the process. I mean, there's no getting out of pain as long as we're in this human experience, right? Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So let me ask you this then, Wendy. How can regenerative purpose help us to improve our professional as well as our personal relationships? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's the same thing. I don't necessarily... Um, it's the same orientation, right? So regenerative purpose is really about a way of being and a way of walking in the world, which is much more uh, interdependent, right? So the old paradigm model of purpose was much more about like my purpose, my goals, my mission, right? And regenerative purpose is much more of a co-creation. It's around listening, right? So I mentioned this before around really deeply listening to what is being asked of us, not from a I'm going to save the world kind of way, because that's still a very egoic uh, way of being in the world, but much more about listening, right? Listening to signals like the pain that we feel and understanding from there how we want to move, right? And I think that applies to any relationship, our relationship to our spouse, to our kids, to our friends, to our communities, to the world at large, right? So in any kind of relating dynamic, and you can scale that up or down, you know, zoom in and out of that. It's, it's the same dynamic of being in balance of our expression Mm -hmm. and our, the the receptivity quality that comes in here, right? The being open to feedback, open to redirection, open to being told that we're wrong, right? Open to being told that what we're doing is not aligned and that we need to shift, right? So even open to hearing things that we may not want to hear so that we can be more with the truth of what's happening in this relationship dynamic between us and whatever the other is. So in listening um, to you speak about regenerative purpose, it seems to me that this can be a tool that we use 
for conflict resolution internally and externally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what are two things that you'd like to impart upon our listeners before we conclude our interview? What would you like them to know? (sighs) I mean, I think the main message is that um, we really need everyone's participation in this, this massive global transformation that's happening right now isn't going to happen with all of us lying on the couch, you know? So I hear a lot of people talking about the new normal and the new paradigm and the next wave and all of this stuff. And that's beautiful and inspiring, but that's not going to happen without all of us playing a part. So it's this interesting paradox of, in a sense, we can make ourselves less important, right? It's no longer about this me, 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 and I need to know what my purpose is and achieve it. But at the same time, for this collective movement that's happening, and it is happening with or without us on an individual level, right? It's going to happen regardless of what I do, what you do. But the, other, the flip side of that is that actually it doesn't happen from everybody stepping back and opting out and watching from the sidelines. Mm-hmm. We need all of us to be in it and we need all of us to be doing our part in it. And that looks different for every single person, but um, there's something about the, the power of the collective, right? Things that seem really small and insignificant to you, when we take them on a global scale, are massive, right? Something as simple as where you buy your groceries from mm-hmm. or how often you drive to visit your friend who's two hours away in your car, it's these little decisions, right? And we're seeing that so, so clearly right now. Mother Nature is illustrating that for us, right? How things change so much just from everyone making small changes. So I guess that's sort of two things in one. Um, It's really this, we need everybody's participation, I guess, is one main message. And the other thing is feel overwhelmed with all the information. I think this is one of the main things that I mentioned before about to really be mindful about the information that we're taking in because this can be so paralyzing, right? The overwhelm that comes from over-consuming information. Um, And so one of the simplest, it's not the easiest, but it's one of the simplest ways that we can contribute to this emergence of the new paradigm is to be mindful about what we're consuming as far as information goes so that we can continue to maintain that clarity of knowing how to participate and how to move from a genuine, authentic place. I love it. I love it. So be mindful, be proactive, come to play, because really this will affect us all on some level. And I I do, as I say, I do believe that we will come through this as better people, you know, for ourselves and for each other. But I can agree with you more that we do have to show up. We do have to do the work because our higher selves are not just going to come to us. We have to work to get there. For sure. I mean, COVID-19 is a catalyst, but it's actually up to us what we do with this pregnant moment that we're in right now, right? It's not going to, the change isn't going to happen on its own. We've been given an amazing opportunity, but the catalyst isn't what creates the change. It's what can spark the change if we choose it, but we still have to choose it and we still have to participate. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Wendy, I want to thank you so much for being on the show with me today. I really enjoyed our conversation. And you just left our listeners with so many wonderful pearls of wisdom. So I thank you for sharing your expertise and your time. And so please tell our listeners, where can they find you on social media? Ah, So you can find me on Facebook, uh, Wendy May. That's my personal page. But my business page is Wendy May Kaistara, which is spelled K A I. S-T-A-R-A. And I'm also on Instagram, Wendy May, with three underscores after my name. And my website is uh, kaistara.com. But if that's too difficult to spell, the easiest way to get there is regenerativepurpose.com. We'll also take you to my website uh, where you can learn more about the book and listen to podcast episodes like this one. And yeah, just learn more about how regenerative purpose can help us all co-create the new normal that we're all wanting to see. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wendy, for, again, sharing your expertise, educating us on regenerative purpose, 
and how we can use that to not only serve ourselves, but our world at large and really, truly our global neighbors, right? Um, so I, I thank you and I appreciate you. And for all of our listeners out there, tune in next time to our next episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. And until then, let's keep the conversation going. Share your thoughts with us. Follow us on our social media page. You can find us at the Global Fluency Podcast on Facebook. And you can also find us um, on LinkedIn. We're on Stitcher, iTunes, all of your social media channels um, for all of your, we're on all of your um, local podcast channels. So thank you so much, Wendy. It was great having you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Global Fluency Podcast. Tune in every second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. for our latest episode. Connect with us on our social media. You can find us on Facebook at Global Fluency Podcast and on Instagram at Westbridge Solutions, LLC. Global Fluency Podcast. Understanding differences. Leveraging commonalities. Let's keep the conversation going. Going.